Okay. I'm going to take a little. I'm going to take a few minutes. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Plum. I appreciate you being here tonight. I didn't think we'd get a big crowd. This is kind of a unique town hall meeting for a legislative deal. I wanted to talk about it. I appreciate. I mean, two 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 groups. Ne Nebo School District for letting us come here tonight. I think the message we have tonight is incredibly important. I know we don't have a big crowd, but I want to thank Spanish Work 17 because we're going to we're going to we're going to put this on Spanish Work 17 and hopefully talk about it quite a bit more. And I and I want to thank my two officers in the back, and, and we're going to have them talk about their experience in, in the end. Um, during this last session, we, we passed a bill dealing with just a response act allowing officers to, to use a drug called naloxone or Narcan. They were already, they were, it was already legal for them to do that, but we made the immunities absolutely clear um, in, in the code. So law enforcement, first responders, they're, they're immune if they use a drug like this. Since it's happened, we, we've got the, the first two officers that had a, had a life-saving uh, event here in Spanish Fork are here tonight. And thank you for being here. Um, since Spanish Fork has started using this in May, they've actually had 10 people that they've saved, actual real people, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But I'm here tonight with Dr. Plum. She's she's an emergency room phys physician up at the University of Utah, and uh, Dr. Plum's bio is out, out on the table, and she's here with her brother Sam, and uh, they've, they've both been affected by opioid abuse. I, I know they, they lost a sibling to opioid abuse, and. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Plum. I mean, this lady is incredible. She, she's on a mission, and we all need to help her because what she's done has saved literally hundreds of lives already, and there, there's more, more to be done. I appreciate you, Mike, being back there, Mike Brower from Utah County. Your guy, I, I know Utah County, the Sheriff's Office is, is going to do this as well. I, and uh, pay attention, ask any questions you, you, you've got, yeah, Dr. Absolutely. Plum. She's here. She is the single biggest resource for using Narcan or Naloxone for law enforcement. So with that, I'm going to turn, turn you loose. Okay. And I know you probably need to take that. So here we are. Here's a graphic done by the Department of Health that he's on his directed campaign. And we're losing more Utahns to accidental overdoses, poisonings, than we are to car crashes. This graphic, every time I see it, and I can't tell you the numbers of times that I've seen this graphic, sums it up perfectly. So drug poisonings or overdoses are the red. Um, oh, is that one better? Okay. Well, that's okay. It's like we're in a movie. They don't need to see me. They can see the, the screens. That's okay. That's just fine. Don't worry. Um, so I've looked at this literally hundreds of times, and Yellow is firearms. It was magic. <laughs> Blue uh, is falls, and uh, purple is the motor vehicle crashes, and reds are overdoses. So what's happening here in these graphics? Well, our population's getting older, more people are falling, cars are getting safer, guns are about where guns have been, but look at poisonings and overdoses. We're literally losing more people to overdoses than we are to cars and guns put together in this state. Nationwide, we're losing more people to accidental overdoses than we are to gun homicides, and as well to car accidents across the nation. And what this resulted in is that Utah, between 2012 and 14, had the fourth highest rate in the U.S. of overdose deaths. Now, 2013 to 2015 data has come out. Utah's now seventh. Initially, you go, okay, that's a good step. No, actually, our numbers have continued to go up. Utah's numbers are still higher, but other states have gotten worse. So we've only fallen because other states have gotten worse. Um, so it's an age-adjusted death rate, so per 100,000. So yeah, they do, so it's not, you know, California would have a lot more population than we did, yeah. Um, the darker red you are in these colors, the more impacted your state is. So the only states above us in this were Kentucky, West Virginia, and New Mexico. If I ask any of you which state is Utah like, or if I ask anyone anywhere when I go talk about this, people say, oh, we're like Idaho, or we're like Arizona, maybe we're like Colorado. Occasionally I'll hear someone say, oh, we're kind of like Oregon. I don't know where that comes from. I've never once heard someone say, we're just like Kentucky. We're just like West Virginia. But in this realm, we are absolutely in the company of West Virginia and Kentucky. This is spread across the nation over the last decade plus. As you go from blue to red, um, this is CDC and National Vital Statistics System data. As you go from blue to red, your overdose death rate is going up. Look at the most recent in 2014. Utah is absolutely in the midst of one of the biggest hotspots in the nation. So what's this look like for our counties? Similarly, as you go from uh, blue to green to yellow to orange to red, your death rate's going up. Almost our entire state now is in a red zone. Here that means you have a death rate of over 20 per 100,000 age adjusted. The national average is about 12.8. 
Utah's average is 22.8. I looked up health department data before I came down. Spanish Fork is actually over 25. So definitely double. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering about the, the source of these, uh, I guess they're prescription drugs. Oh, sure. Uh, is the source black market or is the source uh, uh, pain patients? Well, I'll, let me show you a little bit as I get further on. That's a great question. And that is ultimately where we're going to have to try to figure out, right? Combating this, how do you get to the source of these? Um, a little bit further, an idea just to see where U Utah fits. This is Utah compared to the US. The blue and orange line at the top are the poisonings and drug deaths and the orange and purple are the US. So if you've ever taken statistics, you know that the crosshairs, those little whiskers, if your whiskers cross over, then you can't say it's statistically significant. Our whiskers are, are nowhere even near what's happening in the rest of the US. So what is the majority of, of the substances causing these? Again, it gets broken out a lot of times into prescription opioid pain relievers and into heroin. I personally don't think of them much differently other than I realize there are different strategies we have to take to limit access to those. These are from the NIH and again the CDC. These are prescription opioid pain reliever deaths as they've come through the US, kind of creeping up. Look what's happened with heroin. 2010 marked a pretty big change that happened and, and that was likely related to an unintended consequence of something that had to be done and that was that OxyContin was forced to change the formulation of their pills, um, that you could no longer crush the substance out and people could not use it as injection or use it illicitly or use it recreationally. And unfortunately what happened was a lot of people turned to heroin. What that looks like, it, it, depending on what kind of learner you are, heroin is about one third of the deaths in the US and in Utah and the prescription pain pills are about two thirds. Now de determining exactly what was taking as prescribed and what was inappropriate prescription use versus you know, recreational use is really hard to determine. All you know is the coroner's data said blank was present and that was the cause of death. Um, law enforcement folks can potentially give you a better idea certainly of what they're seeing. They're seeing absolute diversion of medications that were prescribed legally that then find their way diverted into people who they were not prescribed to. Percentage wise, I don't have a good idea of what the numbers are there. But if you look at these numbers, think of that, what's the biggest epidemic we've had in our lifetime, most of our lifetimes at least? It's been AIDS and HIV, right? We're losing more people to heroin overdoses in the US right now. Heroin overdoses alone, not all the opiates, heroin overdoses than we are to HIV AIDS. We're losing more to both of them put together than we lost at the peak of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Five times about increases there on both of those. We've gone up in that 15 year period. So in more in Utah, what does that look like? Well, this is health department data and this looks at the unintentional or undetermined death. So accidental, not suicidal. Uh, and they were averaging at least one opioid related death every day in 2014. Those numbers are up. We're losing about 10 per week now. Um, again, about one third from heroin, about two thirds from prescription pills. My prediction is that that's going to start balancing out as we get more conservative with our prescribing and we don't have resources in place for people who need to get off these opioids in, in responsible ways. Mm -hmm. Does the naloxone also work on heroin? So it's opioid and heroin and heroin is an opiate? Yes. If I were to put up the chemical structures of uh, morphine, fentanyl, heroin, and don't worry, I won't, I, I, I couldn't, but if I were to put them up, all three, all of us in here would go, eh. I don't know which is which. They're that similar. And they, they legitimately cause an overdose in the same way, overdose looks the same way, and you treat an overdose the same way. So naloxone works for all of those, those substances. So as far as who it's killing, if you all picture right now, who's most likely to die from an opiate overdose or a heroin overdose? A picture will pop into your head, right? Now don't you, you you're gonna cheat. <laughs> but you have a picture of who pops into your head, right? And some people will picture, oh, it's a down and out, downtrodden, homeless individual on a bench. It's a, uh, you know, some people will say, a lot of times I've heard, this is Utah, it's someone of a different color than me. That's not the reality. Who we're losing to our prescription pain medication deaths in Utah? These are my cohort. These are my 45 to 54 year old women. That's who we're losing at the greatest rate. These are moms, these are aunts, these are grandmas, these are our community members, our church members, our colleagues. These are people we care about. I'll bet you anything, it was not me that popped into your head that you thought, oh, she's the most likely to die of an opiate overdose. And that's the reality in Utah, especially when it comes to our prescription pills. Now again, that's the way the data's looked at. They do separate these out. I work in the ED, Dr. Hark's in the ED. For me, this is really fascinating. 
who these are the near misses. These are people that are ending up in emergency departments related to an opioid related event. So they either had an effect from their pills that wasn't right, they had an overdose event. Look at that far left side. Less than one year of age, one to four years of age. Those kids are not experimenting. Those kids are not thinking, hey, I wonder what. We just have so many of these substances in our homes that kids are gonna find them. They look like Skittles. Kids are oral explorers. They eat lipstick, they eat cat litter, they eat plants. We all know they do goofy stuff. They're, they, that's kind of what kids do. Unfortunately, the more of these pills that we have in the homes, kids are being more affected. So if I told you in my ER world, I used to tell folks, I was alarmed. In four weeks, I had four kids under eight, all overdosed, just on my personal shifts um, that needed naloxone, meds from their family, kids under eight, until one night on one shift, four kids, four years and under, all in my ED, all on my shift at the same time. Now all the kids got naloxone, all the kids survived, all the families went home equipped with, with Narcan in case or naloxone in case, but that's what this is looking like. This isn't the picture necessarily that we think we're losing folks to. We're potentially losing our youngest. Sam and I pulled all the data from primary children's, every opiate overdose between 2011 and 2015. Admittedly, a biased sample because most teenage heroin overdoses are staying in, in ERs. But if I, if I said I pulled every overdose primary children's, every opiate overdose, what percentage would you guess was zero to five percent? Zero to five years. Sorry, zero to five years. Yeah, zero to five years. What percentage would you guess fell in that? Fifteen. Fifteen. Anyone else? Eighty-five percent were zero to five years of age. So, so uh -huh. zero to five. How many of those are in uh, the children who are uh, receiving it while they're in utero? Uh, so NAS babies. So actually, there were two that were uh, the needle anal abstinence syndrome in that population. There were two that had overdoses on their weaning. So the ER doesn't see the ones that end up in the NICU that are weaned off. Those proportions are going up tremendously. The number of babies that are being born to opiate dependent moms are. Uh, in uh, West Virginia, it's one in 13 babies is, is dependent on opioids. Yeah. I was just curious, uh, you said uh, four kids came in at once. Were they from the same household or different households? Four families, four, four different households. Different so are they Unrelated. Them up and eating them or so them one of them was uh, the way it traced back. Grandpa was on chemo and cancer, chronic, you know, the pain, there's intense pain with cancer, and I do not advocate that we don't treat cancer pain because, yeah, we got to treat cancer pain. We went through it recently with my father, but it, a pill got away. I dropped an 800 milligram Motrin two years ago. I still have not found that thing. I don't know if my dog got it. I don't know if it went down to heating. It just happens, right? Another one uh, was a mom who had her night medication set up on her regimen. Her phone rang. She went to grab it, came back, just got it. Another one uh, was the mom had, had set up all of her click, 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 click boxes, you know, Monday through Sunday, and kiddo got into it. The other one was a Suboxone strip that was in a mom's purse. They look a little bit like Listerine strips. So these were all things that could happen to any one of us. These weren't necessarily particularly neglectful. They were just oopses with potentially really dangerous substances. Oh, yeah, of that group. So if, uh, when I took that uh, whole sample, all the kids at the at Primary Children's Street for Opiate Overdose, the median age, so meaning half below and half above, was one year of age. So these are tinies. These are little itty bitty kids. Now, my focus obviously is not here just to protect the zero to five year olds, but I think see them a little bit as a kind of the canary in the coal mine. That's an indicator of how very prevalent these substances are. And if we're going to have these substances in homes, which we are going to, we need to think about protecting the kids. We need to think about protecting the patients that are taking them. It's, it's just a reality. They're dangerous substances. So what are these? And again, these are all risky substances. I don't think of heroin as more risky than methadone, than hydrocodone. I don't judge the people who take them or need them or use them because it's not the risky person, it's the risky substance in my mind. And you can develop dependence on any of these substances in as little as seven days. So people that are prescribed for a knee surgery, a hip surgery, a tonsillectomy, your wisdom teeth out, seven days in, if you've taken it every day, there will be physical dependence symptoms and withdrawal symptoms as you get off of that. So what that means for us is we need to be aware and we need to be educating people. If you are needing and using these substances, what's your wean plan? What's your plan for if this is not going to be long-term for you? Let's get you down off of it. 
plenty of people, four out of five heroin users started with pain medications. They weren't set up to adequately stop using those, get off of them when they no longer needed them and unfortunately became addicted and dependent. So heroin and opium are those pure opiates uh, I talked about, morphine, fentanyl, Dilaudid, Opana. They are typically injectables, although there are also oral forms. Methadone and buprenorphine, two really important medications that actually treat people who are getting off of opiate dependence. Very important substances, but still opiates, so they still have opiate overdose effects. And there on the right, hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxycontin, Percocet. Most of us have likely had this or have these after, I, I'll, I have to own this. I, when I started doing all this, I cleaned out my medicine cabinet and I had Lortabs from 12 years ago having a C-section with my son. I know better, but you know, something in our minds, well, what if I get a kidney stone on a Saturday? What if I get a bad toothache? What if I sprain my ankle on a camping trip? Like, we all think it's gonna be okay. I have a 13-year-old now. They're gone, and this is my point in the, in the talk where I say, go home, and if you have these, and you're using them for a rainy day or saving them for a rainy day, get rid of them. Take them to Intermountain. A lot of law enforcement agencies have them. University clinics have them. Pharmacies have drop boxes. Get rid of this stuff. You got kids, you got teenagers, you got people who come. A lot of my family's in real estate. They don't tell people to lock up their jewelry anymore. They tell them to lock up their medications. That's what gets stolen from open houses and from people looking at homes they want to buy. It's the medications, yeah. Can you tell me why just like flushing them down the toilet? You know, it's, it's just in general not a good idea to put toxic substances into our water supply. Um, some, England did a sample and they've watched the levels of estrogen go up from birth control, the amount of birth control that's taken. So this finds its way back into our water system. Um, so flushing it's, I mean, if you were in a pinch, absolutely, I would do it too. But uh, you, you want to take it to a, uh, one of those drop boxes or you want to put it into something really unpalatable, so coffee grounds, dog poop, cat litter, you know, nasty stuff that people are not going to theoretically rifle through. But you just, you just don't want to put it back into our, into our water system. I got something on that. Yeah. If anybody wants to put together anything they can, put it back in our office, we explode them. It goes into our evidence locker, and whenever we get ready to destroy every item we have, it gets destroyed. It just goes away with it, away. which is perfect. It just get it out of there. No. <laughs> <laughs> It goes into the big, and they are literally, you know, primary children's, it's weekly that thing in the drop box is full. I mean, people are getting rid of them, but that also means a lot of people have them. Do you have to bring them in? Oh, I'm glad to hear that, though, but it, it's an indicator, right? I mean, a lot of people don't know. Just bring them in the office and they're gone. You don't have to worry about them anymore. 